Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Concerned Citizens for Good Government meeting. Our distinguished guest this evening is a candidate uh, for Lafayette Parish Sheriff. It's Rick Shagwong. He's going to be sitting right here and or, come sit right here, Rick, if you would. And uh, we're going to do a couple of um, introductions and then we're going to yes, get to your presentation. The, uh, I'd like to announce that our next meeting is June 15th, and your opponent, is John Rogers, will be here, and he will be the fourth candidate for Lafayette Parish Sheriff to appear at the meeting. We appreciate it. Y'all coming, uh, introducing yourselves. The, uh, Mr. Rick Shagwa. An extensive law enforcement career began in May 1979 when he became one of the youngest members of Louisiana State Police, having been one of 50 selected from a field of approximately 5,000 applicants to attend the Louisiana State Police Academy. Shagwa worked for the Office of State Police for the next 25 years, achieving the rank of lieutenant during his tenure. Shagwa served in numerous sections within the department, including uniform operation, detectives, for, uh, firearms training and supervisor uh, for training academy and staff training criteria director. West District Narcotic Gaming Enforcement Division and Special Weapons and Tactics at the SWAT team. While serving in the investigative service, Chagua conducted the investigation ranging from crimes against properties such as all field related theft and heavy form equipment theft and crime against persons such as rape and homicide. While assigned to narcotics enforcement, he served as a West District Lieutenant overseeing the, nar the narcotics investigation for a 19th parish area specific to undercover operations, smuggling investigation, and multi-jurisdictional -jur task force. Investigative services round out the investigative service shot while served in gaming enforcement overseeing general gaming investigation and stability and investigative services. Additionally, while serving at Troop High, he served at Hurricane Pre Preparation of Evacuation Coordinator for Troop High. In October 2004, Shagwa retired from the state police to pursue a career in the private sector. Following his retirement, Shagwa worked as a private industry consultant specializing in industrial and corporate security executive protection, loss prevention assessments, invest investigative services, information technology protection, and managed network services and cyber security. Shagwa has also worked in the oil and gas industry serving as a consultant providing administrative and sales related services, enjoying the campaign theme of a new share for a new era and the core of the belief of being a public servant Shagwa intends to focus on an office that represents leadership, integrity, and accessibility. Rick plans to bring the approach and outlook of being the people's sheriff dic <coughs> dictated to serving the public and bringing our community together through competitive outreach and direct community involvement. In the development of future in the Lafayette Sheriff's Office, he, has, he sees Lafayette as a vibrant, progressive, and fast-growing community blessed with deep-rooted community values and exposed business and explosive business growth. And he is dedicated to maintaining his home parish at the highest level so that the growth and community development can continue unimpaired. Rick is a lifelong resident of Lafayette area and a graduate of Lafayette High. He is married to Karen Shotwalk. Together they have five daughters, six grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. He is a pro-life conservative who believes in the Poland of the Constitution and our Second Amendment rights. And we're certainly happy to have you here this evening. Thank you. Let's see. Let's see if I can make this work right. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Is that all right? Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate that great introduction it's kind of hard to follow that you've already told my story so <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about myself from my perspective uh, 
the words that were expressed are great. They actually show some of my background. But I want you to know who I am as a person. Okay, I want this to be more of a conversation rather than a speech where I talk to people and don't get anything back. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly and I'd really like to open it up for questions so that you can ask the questions that are important to you and we can answer and show you a little bit more about myself. But let me start from the beginning. I think it's very important for you to understand your candidate and where he comes from. I'm a lifelong resident of Lafayette Parish. I was born here in 1959 to a man who was a Louisiana State Trooper and from the very beginning he gave me a foundation of character and responsibility. He was a State Trooper throughout my growing years and by the time I reached 18 years old he had reached the rank of Major and he was a regional major and you're asking me why am I telling you about my father because I followed my father like a little puppy okay my father was involved in state police in many different levels and he was the regional commander which was a third of the state police section at the time which was detectives narcotics stock patrol water patrol uniform patrol and I was able to follow him and watch those sections work I was immersed in state police from the time I was a baby all the people that we associated with were state police. It was a public service group of people. So that was the foundation that I started with. So by the time I was 13 years old, I knew I wanted to be in public service. I wanted to be a trooper. So I finished out high school. I received an athletic scholarship. And I went to Northeast University in Monroe to study law enforcement. But there was this nagging in me about wanting to do the job. I had seen it intimately, so I wanted to be involved in it. And my dad made a mistake. He told me one day that I needed to go take the civil service test so that I could see what it was like for after I graduated. So I went and took the test. Unfortunately for him, I passed. Okay, I didn't tell him I passed, so I just let it ride. Well, then a few weeks later, I get a letter from state police. Well, it's time to go take your physical. I'd actually started the process without him knowing. Now, he's a sitting major with state police, okay? <laughs> went through the physical, passed the physical, then they called me and it's time to go down for an interview. But by that time they realized who I was and they called my dad. And he didn't want me to be a trooper, he wanted me to be an FBI agent, so he tried to stop it, but it was already in process. So a few short weeks later I became the second youngest person ever hired to Louisiana State Police. I was 19 years old. And that started my career. I started off in uniform in Lake Charles because I couldn't work in the same place that he was at the time. So they sent me to Lake Charles and I worked in uniform there. Then I was transferred back to Lafayette where I worked in uniform for about a year and a half. And then I was recruited by detectives because I looked so young. I was young, but I looked like I was about 15 years old. They wanted somebody that would work undercover for them. In the late 70s, early 80s, Lafayette had a huge problem. Well, actually, this area had a huge problem with the vice crimes, prostitution, game, gambling, things like that. So I worked in there and did a lot of undercover work in these different places, but I was also introduced to criminal investigations when I was very young. I was doing oil field theft, heavy equipment theft, and homicides. I actually had to go, because I was the rookie and it was the toughest job, nobody wanted to do it because it was just a dirty job. I had to go work all the jail homicides. So after going to LSU Scientific Crime Investigators Institute, I got the unsavory task of every time there was a death in a jail, I had to go investigate the homicide. So at the ripe old age of 21 years old, I was working some serious investigations and stayed there for a while until I was asked to go to, to the training academy. I was a firearms unit supervisor for state police, very heavily involved in the shooting sports and the Second Amendment, and they asked me to go and teach. So I was actually the firearms unit supervisor for state police. I taught there for about four years, which involved me in every aspect of law enforcement training. All of the duties and responsibilities of a state trooper we had to go through on a daily basis. So it actually made me a better police officer to be in that environment. I came out of there and they put me in narcotics. And at that time, narcotics was set up to where the state was divided into three districts. And I had the west district of the state, which was a 19 parish area. So I was required to work with 19 sheriffs and all those chiefs in that area, which was primarily all of southwest Louisiana, from the Texas line to Whiskey Bay, 
from Turkey Creek all the way down to Chalmette. Pretty good size area. And a lot of diverse personalities with all those sheriffs and chiefs. So you had to get along with everybody. But we were very successful. We made some of the largest seizures in that, that time. And our district was always the number one district in the state during that time. And then they transferred me to gaming. And that was a whole new world. Gaming enforcement, <laughs> when they brought gaming to Louisiana, they thought it was a good idea because of the revenue that it was going to bring to you. But they didn't realize the unsavory side of gaming that was going to come in too. But they did give the state police the responsibility of regulating gaming and enforcing the laws for gaming. And when I was brought in, I was put into the general gaming section as a lieutenant. I had a statewide command and we did all of the suitability investigations for anybody that applied for a license to be involved in gaming in the state of Louisiana. If you thought the investigations were interesting in the first career of detectives and narcotics, it didn't even compare to these people. We had to work with lawyers, we had to work with businessmen, we had to investigate everybody from a janitor that wanted to apply to clean the bathrooms in a casino all the way to the people that own the, the corporations. We investigated publicly traded corporations. So I had to bring a team of people together that would be able to be professional, functional, work with these people on a professional level, but still accomplish the goal. So our section, we had not only troopers that were investigators, we had auditors that were employed by the state police, we had attorneys that were employed by the state police, and we had the attorney general's office investigating with us. So it's a collaboration of many people. And I tell you all of that to say this, it's important that the sheriff that you have, that you elect, is able to work with people and bring people together. Law enforcement is no longer a singular thing in a singular geographic area. It's a very big operation now, and we have to be able to work outside of our geographic area with a lot of different people. But let me continue. I retired in 2004. I had been with the state police my whole life since I was born, 25 plus years, and I went into private industry. I opened up a firm that would go into companies and consult in loss prevention. Primarily you go in and look and see who's stealing, what they're stealing, how they're stealing it, or is it just internal controls that you don't have in place that are going you know, to take care of your problems. So we would take a team in, I had an audit, it was almost like I did at gaming. I had an auditor, I had a CPA, we had clerical staff, we had an attorney, and we would go into these companies and look at them and determine where they were losing. We would correct the problems for them and then we'd move on. And we were very successful. But one of the issues that kept nagging at me was private protection of companies was not the same thing as public service. Public service is important to me. It was bred into me. And when I was doing the private work, we got paid well, but it wasn't the same as serving the public. So I wanted to be back in the public sector. I wanted to be able to come back and be the public servant that people need in the sheriff. So last election, not this cycle, but the cycle four years ago, I had several good people ask me to run for sheriff. It wasn't a thing that I was against Mr. Newstrom at all. It was just that I wanted to be the sheriff of this parish. So we actually ran. We ran with three months, $50,000, and I was able to garner 34% of the vote. So I've already done this one time. This is my second time. I was able to gain a lot of name recognition through the last election, but more importantly, I was able to talk to the public for the last four years. I was able to learn what the public's looking for, what they want to see in their sheriff, and I think I can bring that to the table. I think we have an excellent sheriff's office. I really do. I think Mr. Newstrom's done a good job with his vision of what the sheriff's office is. He focused primarily on corrections and rehabilitation. That was his focus for his administration. And I'll be honest with you, he's done an excellent job. Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Office is recognized not only statewide, but nationwide for some of the diversion programs that they're doing, the rehabilitation programs that are in place. But when you look at what he's done, he's done an excellent job on this side, but when you have a budget, you have to place the money where you think it's going to do the best. He placed it into the correction side. 
So in my opinion, the law enforcement side, the public safety side, needs to be enhanced. It needs to be brought up. I want to make that side of the organization just as special as the other side so that we have a uniform department across the board that's recognized nationwide. And I know that I can bring that to that office. So that's a little bit about myself. That's a little bit about my background. There's a lot of details in running the sheriff's office that I could sit here and talk to you about. But I think there's a lot of questions that you may have from walking around the room. There's a lot of questions. Uh, before I, I go to questions, what I'd like to ask each one of you, I think we have some really good candidates in this race. We really do. All the men that are in this race are professional men. They're going to try to do a good job. But what I ask you to do is look at the resumes. Look at their backgrounds. Look at what they've done all of their life. Look how long they've stayed in place and devoted their time and effort to the public service and what they've done while they were there. And I think if you do that and you study our backgrounds, I think you'll find that I bring something okay. to the table that some of the others don't. And I'm not being critical. Some of them are very good friends of mine. I've been knowing them all my life. So it's not an adversarial role. It's just a race for the job that we all want. So I'd ask that you look at our resumes and I'd appreciate your vote and support. So before we go any further, let's ask questions. Okay. I'm in trouble. We appreciate you coming out. Uh, in the mic. Can't hear you. We appreciate you coming out and uh, being with us this evening. I do have uh, four or five questions. First question I have, uh, considering that the current budget for Lafayette Parish uh, Sheriff's Office is about $70 million, if you're elected sheriff, uh, what current uh, financial policies or practices uh, or new policies or practices or improvements uh, will you be adopting? Your okay. Okay. Without insulting you at all, may I offer a correction? The budget is about between 59 and $60 million now. Okay, I was able to go and sit with them to see the current numbers that are available today. So it's a little bit less, but it's still a lot of money, okay? Uh, the question is, with a budget as big as it is, what are we gonna do with it? How are we gonna deal with it? Well, the fortunate thing, one of the things I forgot to mention about my dad, and Mr. Ray will remember this, my dad was a chief deputy at the Lafayette Sheriff's Office for 15 years before he passed away. So I had a very intimate knowledge of the Sheriff's Office its budget, how it was run, because I talked to him on a regular basis. When Sheriff Bro left office, the budget was about $16.5 million, and he had 450 employees. Today, the budget is almost $60 million, and they have almost 800 employees. Out of that 800, about 500 of those employees are dedicated to administration and the correction side. There's less than 300 gun-carrying police officers in that organization. And I think that's a problem. We have to manage the sheriff's office in a very careful way. We have a limited amount of tax dollars that are available to the sheriff to provide public safety and the service, the other services he provides. We need to look at all these programs that he has. We need to go in and make sure that those programs are efficient and they're operating in a manner that provides the best services to the public available. And we have to evaluate the cost of those services as to the benefit. Now I think a lot of these programs are excellent because some of you in this room, I have to tell you, I was the one that caught them. I put a lot of people in jail, okay? And I think there's a need for that. But I also recognize you can't put everybody in jail. The state of Louisiana has the highest incarceration rate in the country. This country has the highest incarceration rate in the world. So police officers are really good at putting people in jail, but we're not really good at rehabilitating them. About 20 years ago, no, about 15 years ago, Mr. Phil Haney and I, the district attorney in St. Martin Parish at the time, we had a case that involved two kilos of cocaine and a kid that was arrested for transporting that, that cocaine. Long story short, that kid got 40 years 
for transporting two kilos of cocaine. And after he does his good time, it's going to be 20 years. He's still in prison today. He was a college kid, never did drugs. He did it just to make money. And I'm not saying he didn't need to go to jail. They had, there has to be a penalty for violating the law. But we've been paying for this kid for 20 years, and when he comes out, he's going to be a criminal. So a lot of these programs that Mr. Newstrom has in place now, they're good programs. They have diversion programs. They have lesser penalties involved for some of the crimes that are committed so that we can rehabilitate people and make them good citizens. Because remember, all those people that are in that jail right now, in the Lafayette Parish Jail, every one of them is coming out. They're coming back into this community. They're going to be next to you in the grocery store. They're going to live at the house down the street. We want to make sure that those people are good citizens and they're going to be good for our community. So we have to do something to try to make sure that they're good citizens. But we don't need to throw a bunch of money away if it's not working. There's a bunch of programs in there that I think we need to look at, make sure that they work, and if they don't work, we need to take that revenue and move it over and make our community safer. And I want to do that without raising taxes. I don't want to go back to the public and say we need more money. $60 million is a lot of money, but we have to manage that money effectively so that we can maximize what we do with it. Thank you. The, um, within the first 90 days of you taking office, assuming you're elected chair, what are the two top priorities that you will implement? The first thing that I have to worry about when you take office is going to be the mass exodus. There's going to be, at the time of an administration change, there's always a huge personnel shift. People that have their time to retire, they choose to retire at that time. People that just don't want to go through an administration change, they're going to go ahead and quit. So I think my number one concern is going to be personnel because that particular organization is a business. It's got a $60 million budget. It's a very complex budget. And we have to make sure that we have the right people around the sheriff that we take care of that budget and we manage that place effectively. The second thing that I have to do is I'm going to start evaluating these programs. And we have to do a needs assessment for our public safety services in the community. So those two things have to go on at the same time. We have to evaluate the needs of the public and we have to evaluate the program so I know where I can go get the funds that are necessary to upgrade our public safety services. We are operating at the same complement of personnel on the road as we were 20 years ago in the Lafayette Sheriff's Office. At that time there was about 70,000, 80,000 people in this community. Now we're at a quarter of a million. So I think the needs for public safety services have to be improved, but we have to do it in a fiscally responsible manner. What role, uh, if any, do you believe that the uh, Sheriff's Office should play in reducing, uh, working with the school board uh, in reducing uh, student truancy problems? I'm glad you asked that question because I had the opportunity to go to the Sheriff's Office juvenile facility where they're actually starting to evaluate juveniles and trying to divert them from the actual juvenile system where you actually put a child and it's just like you put him in jail. Uh, there is only one truant officer in the whole parish. There's one truant officer that works for the Lafayette Sheriff's Office. I met him and he's very overwhelmed. So the juvenile program has already been started. If we have children that have truancy issues or they're given problems at school and they can't be corrected in the school, they are actually brought to this facility. Their parents are required to come. And I say that's important because in a lot of cases, they won't even go to the school to fix the problem at the school. So the, the sheriff's office has to force the parents to come to their office to help fix their children. So there is a, there is a policy in place already, but we're gonna have to develop that even further because it's new, the public's not really aware of it, and we need to increase the number of officers that are working not only as resource officers in the school, but as truants officers. Uh, what role uh, do you envision your administration if you're elected sheriff? Uh, in, will, will your administration play uh, in drug education, the classes, <coughs> giving drug education classes to elementary, the middle school, and the high school? 
fortunately, law enforcement's always been involved in drug education to a certain extent. Over the past few years, they've changed it from the typical D.A.R.E. program, which started in middle school, I believe, and went all the way through high school age. Uh, they have a different kind of program that the Sheriff's Office teaches. But with my background in drug enforcement, I think it's critical and I intend to establish a relationship with the school board where we can involve the law enforcement community back in the schools where they can be present with us again, where they can learn to trust us. Because right now, the juveniles typically, especially in the lower socioeconomic background areas of the parish, they don't trust law enforcement anymore, much less try to learn about drug education and things like that. So we have to go deeper into the community. We have to work with the school board to get more officers in the school to start teaching about drug education. You had mentioned earlier that uh, Sheriff Newstrom had, has developed and received recognition both uh, locally, statewide, and nationally with reference to the current prisoner programs to reduce recidivism or the relapse of chronic uh, criminal behavior. Will you continue uh, Sheriff Newstrom's program, or will you disband the program, or will you modify these successful programs? As I mentioned earlier, we have to go in and look at all the programs. As I said earlier as well, some of them, they work very well. I've been able to look at them, I've been able to see them work, and I've been able to talk to people that work in those programs to assure that what we're being told is accurate, and it is. Some of them are very effective. I don't think that they're deep enough. Remember, when Sheriff Newstrom came in, he decided to take a whole new direction. He brought his vision into the Sheriff's Office, and he started a lot of programs, and he will tell you himself that some of the programs that they've implemented have not yet come to fruition. So some of them are still in the experimental stages, the developmental stages. So I have to look at each one of those programs. So to answer the question directly, there are several of the programs that I think are very effective and I would continue to use those programs and continue to, to evaluate them and develop them to make them even more effective. But there are also programs that are there that probably are not as effective. We need to see how they affect the general public and if they don't affect it in a positive way, we need to do away with those programs and use those resources for something else. Thank you. Pearl Harbor on December the 7th. We didn't do too good a job there, but uh, we got it straightened out later. I do have a question, Rick, and that's um, this uh, clipping from today's uh, independence. They, they dedicated five years to discussing the new election of the Sheriff's Office, which I think is admirable. Very, very good that they recognize that this is the most important election that is coming up uh, for us here in this room right now. <coughs> they mentioned two words there that y'all may not have seen before. One is deterrence, and deterrence is when you slam the door and uh, lock them up and uh, don't give them any breaks over there and they're going to serve 20 years or 40 years or whatever. Like Rick mentioned a moment ago, a young 20-year-old guy getting a 40 year charge, goodness gracious. There must be a way there that we can figure out a way to treat his problem. His problem was he wanted to make a few dollars. And there must be a way to explain to him that you don't make it doing drugs. Another way to do it. The other word they mentioned was diversion. And diversion being uh, the matter that Newstrom has focused on for the past 10 years. And that is uh, taking the lawbreaker and bring them into exposing them into other things to do, putting them in work programs, putting them out on the potato farm out there someplace, but doing things over there. My question to Rick is, Rick, do you follow the same pattern that we have been seeing Mike Newsom follow, 
or do you have a sudden right hand turn in mind, or do you have a, a gradual adjustment of his problem? Can you tell us, please? Thank you, sir. I have to answer that question as a gradual program shift because I don't think we need any sudden turns because of what's going on over there and the amount of investment that you've already paid for into that organization. I do think that the diversion programs work, but I also don't think that we ought to be holding them by their hand and tell them how sweet they are. I think that they have to learn that they've done something wrong and it has to be corrected. Right now they have a couple of education programs and they have a work release program. But the work release program is more about making money than it is about teaching the inmate the best way to move forward. What I want to see is the inmate program expanded. I want a real prison farm where they go out and they grow their own fruits and vegetables and raise chickens and pigs and they feed the jail. Okay? I want them to be able to do that. It teaches them responsibility. The second thing is I want to have programs that teach them trades instead of just out there picking up paper and trash and cans. They need to do that too. But you shouldn't have to pay for that to be done, and that's being done right now. Every municipality around here that has those inmates walking around picking up paper and cutting the grass, the municipality pays for it. You've already paid taxes for that. That's supposed to be done. They're in jail. They need to work. I want them to be able to go through education programs that are going to teach them trades. I want them to be able to learn to be plumbers and carpenters, electricians and welders, and I want to put them in that work release program and teach them how to assimilate into society and be able to sustain themselves rather than regressing back and going to sell drugs again for money. I want to make it a more effective program. Remember, he started off good and he's brought it as far as he's going to bring it in his administration. We're going to bring it further and we're going to make him more responsible. And remember, I don't think everybody needs to have a diversion program either. There are evil people in this world that need to go to jail. Okay, That's what I did all my life. So we need to take those that need to pay a penalty by being in jail to get that penalty and those that can be rehabilitated, we need to rehabilitate them and make them the best citizens that we can make them. Did I answer your question, sir? Thank you. Oh, Lord, now I'm in trouble. I've been knowing this man for a long time. About 200 years. <laughs> No, he worked with my wife. My wife was the very first female hired by Tupai here in Lafayette many years ago. So I consider Rick one of my friends, right? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Rick, most people are not aware that as the sheriff of the parish, you have more law enforcement power than the FBI, the CIA, uh, all of the organizations combined, and they cannot come into this area without your permission. I'm sure you're familiar with the Jade Helm situation that's yes, getting sir. ready supposedly to take place in Texas and several other places. In the event they want to use Lafayette as one of their playgrounds, what is your opinion on that? Well, first off, I'm, I'm not real sure of how far reaching Jade Helms is going to actually be as far as supplanting government and things like that, but I'm very suspicious of the whole operation. I don't agree with the federal government coming in and extending themselves over the citizens. The sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer of the parish in the state of Louisiana, and that's an awesome responsibility. And the primary thing that he's sworn to do is uphold the Constitution and protect the citizens of his parish, and I intend to do that. I would stand with the other sheriffs, and I say that because I know that in Louisiana, the Louisiana Sheriff's Association lobby is the strongest lobby in the state of Louisiana. And they pretty much all stand together when it comes to matters like this. We do not intend to let people come in and run roughshod over the citizens in this parish. They're not going to come in and take your guns. They're not going to declare martial law without the consent of the sheriff. I'm not going to allow it. That was my second question. Would you allow martial law to be imposed for this reason? We have had in our constitutional classes the other three candidates, and he's going to be our guest on the 27th of June. We're going to save one of the questions until then. I don't want him to refuse to come and see us. But in the event that the president or anybody else 
does declare martial law, can we depend on you depending on Lafayette first or uh, as one of our serious candidates, and I won't mention his name, he said, well, if it's the law, I have to obey it. But I said, wait a minute. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, so which are you going to obey first? Uh, should the President or anybody else declare martial law or the Constitution? It's not really a tough one. You're going to uphold the Constitution of the United States. That's the answer right there. Now, last question. I have asked the other three sheriff candidates their opinion about the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service quiz, which is 100 questions that all immigrants must pass in order to become citizens. Would you, at your convenience, take the same quiz that the other three sheriff candidates said that they will take? Absolutely. I don't have any Here problem taking that quiz. <laughs> Where do you want me to bring it when I'm done with it? On the 27th, when you come out to us, I'll bring it back to you. Okay. Absolutely, but I knew you'd throw me under the bus. You're a good boy. You can take it. I can take it. Let me put it to you this way about the immigration thing. I understand where this question's going. We want to make sure that the people understand what is required to be a United States citizen. And I agree with that 100%. I think our education system has failed our students and they're not taught the proper things that they need to be taught while they're in school. And I think this is a good idea. You know, it makes, it makes them aware of what their requirements are. But I've also been asked the question, and, and it may be stepping off into some rough terrain, we have a lot of immigrants that come and work in this country. This country was formed by immigrants coming here. So I don't have a problem with immigrants that go through the proper processes to come here if the farmers decide they have a need, if, they, if there's a, a lack of employees here and they need help, that's fine. I do not want them to supplant our, our employees and our workers here. I want them to abide by all the laws to get here and abide the laws while they are here. Illegal immigration, that's out. I don't believe in it. letting them walk and do what the hell, heck, excuse me. It's, it's just a very sensitive subject to me, okay? I think that illegal immigration, it's not a huge problem here, but it's a problem. And as the sheriff, we have enforcement personnel. When we find illegal immigrants, we will take police action against those people. In the sentence. The ones that are here legally, we will work with them, and again, if they violate the law, we will take action against them as well. They're here already, so we have to deal with what we have. But I agree with this right here. Okay. Thank you, sir. You talked about what your dad did. You never told us his name. His, his name was John Eric Shardwell. People called him Shag or Eric. You never mentioned a word about your mother and who she was. <laughs> My mother was a sweet lady. Her name was Mary Ann Marks. She was sweet to me and it depended on who knew her out there. She was a tough lady. She came from very humble beginnings and she made herself a very special lady. Where do you live? I live out about five miles south of Dusson in the rural part of the west side of the parish. I was born and raised in Lafayette. I was actually raised for the first seven years off of Madeline Street, which was just north of the tracks on University. And then he moved to, to a house in uh, Camellia, just off of Camellia, and I lived there until I was 18 years old. So I was born and raised in the center of Lafayette. I went to Lafayette High School. Last time I heard you speak, I stood up and mentioned Sheriff Arpaio's program. And you just kind of waffled a little bit on that, but tonight you said you were for a state farm for many of our, uh, many of your clients or prisoners or whatever you want to call them. And uh, I'm very much for that. I think it's a wonderful thing. Today I learned that 28 states, the U.S. Attorney General, has been replaced within the past year. Our state, uh, David Caldwell, Attorney General, is intact. 
but the U.S. Attorney General has been replaced, and he has authority to shut your department down. Okay. Come, please. Thank you. He has the authority, but does he have the ability? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but again, the sheriffs in the state of Louisiana, as in several sheriffs around the country that you're familiar with, they're, stra they're standing strong against the federal government. They're going to band together, and we're going to stand strong against oppression, oppressive rules, laws, regulations that are counterproductive to our community. I'll stand there until they put me in jail. It's my job to defend you and the Constitution of the United States. If he comes and he tries to take over, he'll have to do it. I mean, that's all I can say. I mean, you're asking me a very sharp question that's got one answer. I'm either going to stand or I'm going to cave, and I'm not going to cave. Something has to be answered before it comes up. That's right. So, but that's the only answer I can give you. I hope that was satisfactory. Can you get by the jacket? Just, uh... Yeah, can we bring her the mic? That'd be the better thing. You may get it now, Rick. Sir? You may get it now. I'm sure. <laughs> Rearrange everything here. A small question, an ignorant question. My name is Jackie Lopez. Yes, I want to know where the office is for the sheriff. I've never been to the sheriff's office. Where is it located? It's on the corner of Lafayette and Main Street, downtown, right across the street from the courthouse. Okay, I want to start off by telling you one thing okay. that needs to be corrected, and I don't know if you can do it, but it's not handicap accessible to get up and go in. When you park on the corner where it is, you're way down like this, you know, if you park on the corner. And there really are no easy ways to get in and out of the courthouse. So. My granddaughter told me that I can park anywhere I want to if there isn't anything accessible for me. Is that true? Yes, ma'am. As long as you have the handicap tag or license plate, you can park where it's convenient for you to get in. You hear that? <laughs> I didn't yep. know that I'm handicapped. You hear that? Yep. We, we yep. don't have to try to drive around and around and around to find a place to park. And if oh. I'm sheriff and they give you a ticket, come see me. We'll take care of that. Oh, but I will. I'll. The other thing what happened was at that place, the parking lot that's directly in front of the building was open to the public at one time. And it had handicapped parking. It had ramps that you could get into the office very easily. But they closed that off and they made it employee parking. That'll be taken care of right after we take office. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. I'm an advocate of handicap accessibility. I used to get in trouble. I was actually called into my captain's office one day because I was off duty one time and I had some people park in a handicapped parking <coughs> lot. And I had my family in the car with me and I got out and showed them my badge and made a move. Mm -hmm. And they made a complaint to my office, so I'm also very sensitive to okay. it. Okay. I don't, I don't mind them parking in the handicapped place, except when somebody parks in a handicapped place, then they are robbing that person of a place to park. And if they go park at another place, they're robbing other people of a place to park. If you're not in handy, I can go anywhere with this, my wheels. Okay, I want to ask you also, how many people in the Sheriff's Department are under the civil service? How, does it, how many people does it take in? Who, no. None. No one in the sheriff's department is civil service. Is that right? They all work at the will of the sheriff. Okay. If he comes in and doesn't like the way you look, he can lose your job. And I've heard from reliable sources that the sheriff is the most important person in the parish. He controls more money and he has the ability to 
say what other people cannot say and do. And that's fine with me, I don't mind. I have a grandson that's a policeman in Youngsville, also SWAT team, also investigative, also things you have done. Okay. And my other one is that I've just recently read that marijuana, I know that's true, a lot of places are letting marijuana come in. And also the, the thoughts are that they're coming down too hard on some of the kids that have not reached <coughs> a sensible age yet that are doing marijuana. And perhaps when they get a little bit older, maybe they will be more responsible citizens. So what's going to happen with, with the marijuana? You have a trend across the country right now with marijuana where people are trying to reduce the penalties for marijuana. Right. And I think it's because there is so much of it out there. We're filling our jails with people that are in there for using marijuana or selling marijuana. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, right now, the laws are what they are. So I have to work closely with the judicial system to make sure that we're all in concert to determine how we're going to handle these minor violations. It costs an extraordinary amount of money to house a prisoner over a minor marijuana possession charge. Now, I think that people that are distributing drugs, it's, it's a worse crime. It's a level above that we have to deal with. But what's your opinion? How do y'all feel about this position? Y'all are, are concerned? I, I really don't know. I, I don't even know what it smells like. But It's nasty, trust but, me. And it makes you stupid. Yeah, but... Um, I understand that the different states are, are, some of them are growing marijuana. I understand it's very hard to get a license to grow the marijuana, to be registered. <coughs> I know of someone in Washington State right now that's got lots of property and they want to grow marijuana, but they have not been approved yet. They're not able to do it. It's strict laws for that. So, I really would like your opinion, but let me give you my position from working in narcotics. When I worked in narcotics, I had a couple of opportunities that were pretty extraordinary. We were trained by DEA, and we had doctors that came in and taught us about the effects of marijuana on the brain. Now, people are going to say, well, you can compare it to alcohol and all this stuff, and you can, but alcohol is already legal. Okay, I don't, I don't have a position on that. That's just too bad. <laughs> I understand, but some people would disagree with you, okay? I do know that marijuana is destructive. I know it's just as destructive, if not more destructive, than alcohol. Is it a gateway drug? Some people say yes, some people say no. You know, when we were working drugs, we had marijuana that we dealt with all the time. And a lot of times, those people, they did other drugs and they did other sales of drugs. So, it's a corruptive influence. It affects your brain. So. I have a problem with it. I happened to go to Jamaica one time and I was able to speak to one of the ministers in Jamaica. Their number one national product, even though it's against the law, is marijuana. And they were asking me because I was involved in state police narcotics, what I thought, and I asked them what they thought. How is it affecting your community? Because everybody in Jamaica, generally speaking, for the, mo the majority of the population, smokes marijuana. He said it's making our population ignorant destroying their brain. I said, well, then you've answered your question. <laughs> okay, I have MS, and one of the things that they advocate is that marijuana will help people with MS. Now, if I get to know some people who don't walk, and all of a sudden, I know they're smoking marijuana and they're walking. I'm gonna find some. <laughs> Just one second, Judge. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Ms. Jackie. As far as medical marijuana, I think it's being researched and it's it's actually being used in a lot of cases. And if it's prescribed and it's given to you in the proper way, it's a good thing. The medical community approves it. And there are already laws on the books that regulate medical marijuana in the state of Louisiana. You can get mar you can you can be prescribed medical marijuana in the state of Louisiana. You just can't possess it. The laws conflict with each other, so it's something that they're going to have to deal with at some time. And I know right now, I don't know if it's finished, but there was a bill in the legislature recently about approving medical marijuana and its distribution in the state of Louisiana. 
I think it was Senator Fred Mills put that in. And I'm not sure of the status of the bill right now, but in Louisiana, it's ongoing, <coughs> sir. Continuing along this line, big concern I have with it, people that smoke marijuana and then they go out and drive. <laughs> like beer. Uh, are, do we have tests for driving under the influence for marijuana? Yes, sir, we have tests. We have the police officers that are they're trained in what's called nystagmus. You can actually look at people's eyes and determine what kind of level of abuse they have at the time and if you if you determine that there's suspicion to go further they actually have test kits that you can do on the side of the road you're not going to get immediate results on those tests you have to wait for them but if you suspect that the driver is impaired you can remove him from driving anyway then you wait for your test then he can be charged accordingly at that time but, but just like alcohol they can kill somebody while they're absolutely and i agree with you the thing is you're asking me as a sheriff how I feel and what I would do, how I feel is not as important as what the laws are currently on the books, okay? Unfortunately, the laws are the laws, they're in place, and we have to respond to the laws that our legislature put together for us. And as the chief law enforcement officer of the parish, I'm required to enforce those laws. Unless? Unless they're unconstitutional. Don't worry, I hadn't forgotten. It's okay. I won't forget. I've already gone on record tonight saying some stuff nobody else would. Okay? So, I have to enforce the laws of the state of Louisiana, hands down, unless they're unconstitutional. And currently, those laws are not unconstitutional. So, we, we have to do what we have to do as an elected official and somebody sworn to uphold the law and protect the citizens. Somebody asked about the prison farm. Who asked about the prison farm? Okay. Right now there is a small prison farm and they're required to go out and work and raise vegetables and all that, but it's not nearly what's necessary to feed the population. This population is about 12 to 1300 inmates right now. So it requires a lot. I have seen the farms of the cattle, horses, huge farms. Yes, sir. And they seem to be pretty self-sustaining. They're very self-sustaining, and they are also willing to help sheriffs get theirs set up. They'll show you how to do it, what the things you have to go through to make sure that they're successful. There's also another way to make revenue off of that farm. There's a lot of places like, for example, Fresh Pickens and things like that. They buy produce directly from some of the sheriffs. So if you're producing enough to not only sustain your inmates, or you can actually sell that produce, and you can make money for the parish. Okay. But I think that the farm needs to be expanded. I need. I think that it's a good job for inmates to, to learn responsibility. They learn what's required of them. They can actually get a job when they leave there if they, after they've worked on a productive farm. They learn to work with animals. When you're starting to talk about rehabilitating people, you need to find things that affect them in a positive way. And when you put them in that, far, in that environment, you get them away from the destructive environment of being inside the prison itself. They have to serve their penalty, they're in jail. But you take them out and you put them in a productive, positive environment, it does work. It rehabilitates. They get to where they don't want to go back into that place, they want to keep doing what they're doing out here. So these types of situations, they found that several of the sheriffs around the country have also adopted the animal shelters in their area. Why? Because you can put a half a dozen to a dozen inmates caring for these animals on a daily basis, and what does it require? It requires a connection. It's something that they have to be responsible for. Now you're evaluating the whole time. You're not going to go put a, a guy that would hurt the animals in there. But just a small program like that shows them love and affection that they may have never gotten at home. And the sheriffs are reporting that it works. So there's a bunch of different things that we're talking about as far as the, the programs that we're going to use to enhance what's already there. Okay. Yes, sir. That's John Rusho. I'm John Rusho. Post 69. I've actually, I've actually met him before because I chose the American Legion Hall to do my public announcement. I like the veterans. Uh, I want to ask you, what do you think of that sheriff's program that he has in Arizona that has these prisoners all wear pink and they're behind, they're living in tents and uh, uh, 
he's gotten a lot of flack from the federal government, the federal justice department, trying to make him change that. I can't remember his name. Or Ohio. Arpaio. Sheriff, Sheriff Arpaio. Gerald Arpaio. Anyhow, uh, I understand from the, what I've read and I've seen that his program has been very effective because the people that go there do not want to come back to his jail. And he has, he's in the red. He has uh, kept his uh, budget in the red because they get fed sandwiches, one good meal, and then sandwiches all during the day. They all have to work and they do not have air conditioning. And they don't get reading material unless they, they work for it and they, uh, they earn it and stuff like this. And it's censored. It can't be like Playboy, Playgirl, whatever you call them and stuff like this. Uh, and he says, uh, of course, he's been criticized by a lot of the uh, sociologists and, and, and uh, workers that work with prisons and stuff like this. But he, the people that do go there and do finish that term never come back and cr create the same crime in his area. <laughs> so what do you think about his program? I've actually studied his programs. Uh -huh. He's he's a fairly extraordinary man because he's an individual and he does what he believes is right. But what a lot of people don't see, they see the tent city, they see the pink clothes, they see the heat, you know, and he compares them having to suffer in 115 degrees in a tent as compared to our soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> Why should you be any better than what they're having to go through? And I agree with that. The issue is what people don't what people don't understand about his programs he's got a very complex system of programs for rehabilitation he not only has people sleeping in tents the reason they're in tents is because he ran out of space in his typical prison so he just put up tents and he put them in them okay. they're in jail all right i mean they didn't have air conditioners 50 years ago so they're in jail but he also has a chain gang did you know that he had a chain gang the chain gang's voluntary can you believe that Inmates will volunteer to be on a chain gang. Why? Because he's got also psychological programs to determine what these people's issues are. And it's recommended for people that can't work with others. They can't relate to others. Well, I'm going to teach you how to relate to somebody. I'm going to chain you to another person. Okay? And they do. And in one of these particular cases, there was a female chain gang, because he has a male chain gang and a female chain gang. Female chain gangs working on the side of the road and a woman stops in the van, talks to the deputy and says, would it be okay if I bring them something cool to drink? And the deputy sheriff said, sure, as long as you bring something for everybody, meaning the deputies as well. She leaves, she goes get them some water and drinks and brings the chain gang the drinks. The deputy asks her, why did you do this? Why would you stop for this chain gang on the side of the road? She said, because I was in that chain gang. I got out, it worked for me, I'm a successful businesswoman now, and I remember what it was like being on there, so I wanted to bring something cool to drink. His programs work, okay? They're not, they're not palatable to some of our society, but they work for him. He also stands up against the federal government at every turn there is. So I agree with a lot of his programs, but I also want to do our rehabilitation in the most humane manner possible but I'm not gonna go overboard and waste a whole bunch of money just to say that we're being humane. We're gonna do it as effective as possible, and yes, sir. But look at the prison downtown. It's what, seven stories, air conditioned, uh, 47 channel TV, comfortable beds, clean floors. That's ridiculous. They're pretty sir. Well, that's the way it, to think about. that's the way it used to be, okay? I'm talking to Sheriff Newston. Okay. He said liability is the main reason they don't do a tent city here in Lafayette. What liability? He has insurance. He's got a medical staff to evaluate him on a regular basis. This is his excuse to me because I have talked with that for about three years. I understand. He said the liability is too much. Well, they're getting ready to build a tent and put the homeless people in it. <coughs> one or the other. I agree. We appreciate all of the questions, but we would appreciate you coming up, up here to put it through the mic. We have a pretty good uh, film man here, and he can do a real good job, so we'll have something to show. We appreciate you coming up in the front. Rick, thank you for coming tonight and speaking with us. I think you've done an admirable job, and I think it reflects well on you that you've been complimentary to your opposition. It makes us feel good. 
and it's apparently your true feeling about that. I was not going to push my way up here once he got in talking about chain gang. Kind of scared me. <laughs> but my concern that I want to ask your opinion on is the condition of law enforcement in general around the nation. All of us, I think, are disturbed by what's happening in places like Ferguson and Baltimore and, and other areas where, where law enforcement seems to have broken down for many reasons. And I don't think those problems are going to be restricted to just those localities or just this time. It appears they're going to continue and we're going to be wrestling with that for some time. So maybe you would comment on uh, that condition. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It's an excellent question. And it's something that I've spoken to in a few of the different events that I've been to. It's a very good question for a couple of reasons. We have a breakdown that's occurring in society right now that we've never seen before. Years ago, people respected the law enforcement community. The law enforcement community were leaders in our communities. They were trusted individuals. They were officers of the court. In some of these major areas, They've not been selecting people properly. They've not been training people properly. And some of these policemen, and I have to admit it as much as I don't want to, they've abused their authority in some cases. And it causes the community to rebel. Okay. Now remember, those communities that are being affected, they're typically low socioeconomic. They have a lot of times less education. They're being taught that the police are not to be trusted. So it's developed over time that there's a lack of trust for our law enforcement community. We've, we're very fortunate in Acadiana that we have good people. We have a, a melting pot here of very good people. Our community is diverse and we still care about each other, but we do have problems in our community. Whenever you see a crime committed, and there's a lot of them being committed now, you have crimes against persons on a regular basis, we're hearing about shootings, we're hearing about bodies, we're hearing about home invasions. When I look at this stuff on Facebook, Facebook's a barometer, whether you like it or not, it's a barometer. You see a news report and then you go down and you look at the comments of the public. About 80% of the public that comments does not trust law enforcement. They hate law enforcement. That's an indicator of what's going on in our community. So you're going to need a sheriff. Remember, his role as a chief law enforcement officer of the parish. We need a sheriff that's going to step out into that community and gain that trust back. I want to show them the background that I have. I want to go out there and work with them and try to bridge the gap that's growing right now. The other thing that we have to do as the chief law enforcement officer we can work collectively with those other chiefs around here. The Lafayette Police Department's a really good police department, but they're getting a bad rap. A lot of people dislike the Lafayette Police Department because they feel like they're too harsh and they're becoming somewhat militaristic. I agree in some cases, but these are good guys that want to do the job the right way. So we need to teach our deputies that I have direct control over. We need to hire the right people that understand the problems in our community we need to teach them how to deal with the public and recognize that we're public servants. We work for you. We work for you. And a lot of those guys forget that. There's another thing that happens. You mentioned one particular incident, and I'm not going to second guess any police officer in a shooting situation. We can evaluate that situation. But the Ferguson incident, that was a big boy that he was dealing with, very violent individual and he attacked the police officer and he beat the police officer bad. He beat him in his car and he tried to take his gun away from him and he finally got him off of him. When he got him off of him, he was in a place where I have to do something now. What do I do with him? I gotta call him back. He knew he couldn't beat him. He was scared, okay? The Constitution, I mean the uh, Supreme Court gave him the authority through previous decisions because he knew he was outmanned, he had to defend himself, he shot the man, he killed him. But there's training there that was necessary. There's alternate methods that were there. Why didn't he implement a taser? Why didn't he? Again, I'm not second guessing the man. What I'm telling you is you can look at these incidents and see this could have been different if the officer would have been handled differently, if he'd have been trained differently. If he'd had backup, he was in a position where he could have used support and he didn't have support there immediately for him. There's a whole lot of things that circulate around these issues 
but then the community feels like they're picking on us. So it evolves and it blows out of proportion. Don't think that that's not happening here. Last year they had two marches in Lafayette in support of these people. Okay, We have people in this community that are sympathetic to what's going on in Ferguson and what's going on in Baltimore. So we have to be able to get into this community and bridge that gap and try to calm that animosity down and break that distrust down. I've talked about it many times and I feel like I have the ability to do that. I'm, I'm very good with that side of our community and I think that we can make a difference. Do we have any other questions? Ed? Yeah, right. <laughs> the camera. And he knows what he's doing. Yeah. And, and, and my question has to do with cameras. Um, <laughs> body cameras. Uh, I know I talked to a police chief in uh, Scott. He said his officers are wearing them. I'm wondering what your policy will be and how you feel about them. And do you think it benefits? Does it not benefit? Pro and con. And I know one of the huge problems they're having is that the officers that wear them bring in all this data. It's a gigantic amount of data. What do you do with it? That's right. Thanks. Well, fortunately for now, the, da the, uh, the body camera issue for the Lafayette Sheriff's Office has already been addressed. And I'll speak to it, but the sheriff has already approved purchasing body cameras for all of the patrol deputies that are out there. What they're going through now is the, the monumental task of writing policies on their use, how they're going to store their data, who's going to store the data, what data are they going to store, because every contact that they make now becomes public record. Okay, Do they keep it? How long do they keep it? And it's going to be a massive amount of data that they're going to have to pay somebody to store it and make sure it's not lost. How is it going to be cataloged? Who's going to be responsible for it? It, it's a nightmare. So it's already been approved for the Sheriff's Office. They're working out the kinks in it right now. By the time I would take office, they're going to already be in service. So I would have to go in and evaluate that just like any other program there. Is it effective? Is it something that we need to do? Personally, I think body cameras are a good idea for one thing, evidentiary purposes. It actually shows what's going on in front of the police officer. but. How many times have you seen a video on television or on Facebook or whatever and they show this just myopic view of the police circumstance and that's all you see. You don't see the rest of the area around you that actually influences what he's doing right here. Okay, I, That's the only issue I have with cameras, period. We've all seen dash cam video, but you don't see what's going on around the police officer and all of that affects the decisions that he makes when he's dealing with the violator. If I, if I go into a bad area, just pick the worst area you can think of in Lafayette. I'm wearing my body camera. I have a violator. I'm a white guy, he's a minority. I go to start to deal with this man. He might just be a belligerent drunk that's, he's not really fighting me, but he just doesn't want to go. Okay, so if I'm out in the middle of nowhere, I can handle him, I can talk to him, I can do what I want with him, I can take my time. I can coax him into the car. I did it for years. We talk people into going to jail every day. Okay? It's true. I talk you into going. You, do you want to go to jail? No, I'm going to talk you into it so I don't have to fight with you. Okay, that's what you're watching. But what if I have 20 or 30 people standing outside of the camera view and they're all threatening to come beat me up because I'm trying to arrest the guy? I'm going to expedite this now. You're going to see me get more aggressive, more rough more quick, more responsive, and get him out of there very quickly. And when you stand back and look at that video, you can say, uh, he was too rough with that guy. He didn't have to do all of that. These people are getting ready to hurt me. <laughs> that's not in the camera. So that's what I'm trying to explain to you. They're excellent tools. They have excellent evidentiary purpose. But they don't show you everything. Okay? And sometimes they can actually be used against the officer. Will I use them? Of course I'm going to use them because they have more benefits than they have negatives. But you need to understand they're very expensive to use and keep and you have to keep up with the technology because it changes all the time. And they also have some weaknesses built into them. Do we 
we have any, uh, we have another question in hand. I want to know if I'm hallucinating. I like what I hear. <laughs> you're not hallucinating. <laughs> yeah, I think you're awake. That's very good, AJ. Can you repeat that? I mean, I want the cameraman to get that. He got it. That you're not hallucinating? Tell him he is. Tell him he's hallucinating. I have one more question. I have one more question. I can do it from right here. If I have any, if I need a, a law enforcement officer, and I live in Lafayette. Who do I call? Do I call you or do I call the police? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question so we get it on camera. What she asked is, she lives in Lafayette, and if she calls for a law enforcement officer, does she call me as the sheriff or does she call the city police? What you actually do is call 911, yeah. and they yeah. should respond. Now, some people, and this has been going on since the Bro administration and through the Newstrom administration, if you want a sheriff's deputy to come to your house, I don't care where it is, you tell 911 I want a deputy, a deputy's coming. Good. Okay? So if you want a sheriff's deputy, we're going to come. But typically you just call 911 and they'll dispatch whatever is the appropriate officer. I probably wouldn't know which one I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know who to call. The city does. It's the city in the city limits, I call the police. Just call 911. Yeah, the dispatcher knows who to send where, and she'll send that person that's responsible. Right. But typically, yes. But under under my administration, we're going to work more closely with the other agencies. We're going to support them as well. Well, in Chicago, when I was in property management, I used to use the city police. I'd call 911, and I had such bad, bad service that I started calling the sheriff's department. And I've got to tell you this, this is under the road administration, this last years in, in office. And uh, I was so impressed with how the deputy sheriffs handled the same situations that were not handled by the city police, that I never called the city police back again. I understand. Uh, well, that's an, uh, a problem right there. <laughs> and and as, as I said, if you call for the sheriff's office, we will come. Not a problem. Okay. The, the good thing about becoming sheriff under this new era, the, one of the first things we said when we started, this election is important. It's going to frame law enforcement in this community for the next 20 years. So it's very important that you select the right guy. And what I'm telling you is, I am a sheriff that's gonna be accessible to the people. I wanna hear what you have to say. My door is gonna be open. If you have a problem, you come talk to me. You will always be able to see me. I will answer your phone calls, okay? I will respond to you. We, we've coined a phrase called the people sheriff and that's what I truly believe. Law enforcement is a public service. As sheriff, I'm not better than anybody. You talked about being the most powerful person in the parish. It depends on your perspective. I can be very powerful if I choose to be, but what I choose to be is the person that works for you as your public servant, and I make sure that the people that we employ provide the best services available to the public. That's what's important. Okay, And if I can use that authority with other agencies to help them agree to police in the same manner, that's what we're gonna to try to do because all the chiefs generally do work together very well. So they're gonna be looking for this guy to be responsive to them, to work with them, to help them, to support their organizations just as well. And if we can start working collectively together and in the same manner, then you're gonna have positive law enforcement in this parish. More questions? Being here, and especially our guests. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your signing. Thank you, sir.